Hey everyone, Danny here. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode number 247. We are going to continue on in our journey through Mark um, as we just uh, read a chapter and as uh, impressions come to mind, we'll just unpack and, and talk through some things. So thanks again for being with me and I hope this is a blessing. Uh, starting back in Mark chapter 2. And it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. I can't help but think here, and I think I've mentioned this before in a previous episode, uh, but here it comes again. Um, when Jesus is here doing his ministry and preaching the word, people are gathering in such large numbers there was no room left, not even outside the door. Does that remind you of, uh, think back to when Mary and Joseph are looking for a place to stay um, and she's near, you know, about to give birth, and there's no room for them, and uh, not even in the inn. And so they they have to stay in in a stable where a place where the animals would be kept. Here we see it in a, in a different, much later part in Jesus's life, where uh, that is is shifted. It's changed, and so. Um, each of us, I think, have an opportunity. Uh, you know, th- things happen to us, and our lives go a certain way. Whether that's um, because of the the natural course of you know a, de- a depraved world, or uh, through the you know, special um, organization of God's plan in your life, whatever the case is, however it transpires, it transpires a certain way. And just like we saw at one point, as, as Jesus was going to be born, there was no room for him. Now, in a different phase in his life, there is barely room for them. And he's on the other end of it. And I think whenever our stories, whenever they change and evolve in our lives, we have an opportunity to be perhaps on the other side of where we used to be. And so I think each of us have an opportunity to, will we steward those, those moments of, um, let's say lifted up, but that's not really the right word. Um, perhaps an elevated place. Will we, will we not lose sight of maybe where we came from? Let's say our humble beginnings and, and not lose sight or let the uh, the elevated place get into our hearts and do something that um, it change us into someone different. Um, but I, I find that this is very interesting and it v- is very reminiscent of of that manger scene and moment in at the beginning of Jesus's life. And so not even outside the door, there wasn't room. And he preached the word to them. So he was faithful in that task. Verse 3, some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Um. Whenever you're reading scripture, do you ever find yourself um, captured by something, but you don't know what it is? There's something there for you to discover. It's like you have a fascination with with a, a line, a phrase, a word, something like that, and there, but you don't really know why you're attracted to it. But there's something attracting to you. Um, I find that here just now. You probably maybe noticed my my repetition. There's something there, um, and I don't quite know what it is, especially just naturally here in the moment. So um, think on that. Uh, think of what um, maybe could be found. I Just off the cuff here, 
I'm thinking about there's a paralyzed man they're bringing. So that's one man. And he's carried by four of them. So there's five men total at, that we know of, at least. And I then immediately think of, you know, the fivefold ministry. So is there is there something is there something to discover there as it relates to the picture here of what happened in this account involving five men and as it relates to the fivefold ministry? Maybe so. Think about that for yourselves. Verse 4, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Um, I can't help but admire Jesus in this moment. Uh, it, as, as we notice, it, they're very eager to get to where Jesus is. And there's no room, so they uh, boldly go up to the roof and they dig through it and lower the man on the mat. I mean, just honestly here, I I might, knowing the way I am, I might, I might get annoyed or angry at what they did. Um, it's not their house or their roof. How could they dare damage someone else's roof? I mean, I would think, what are you doing? Like, you're not, do you have permission to do that? But Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He sees their faith. And that's interesting because Jesus saw their faith. Maybe it includes the man in the, on the paralyzed man, or maybe it doesn't. There could be the four. They may be bringing the man himself. Um, nonetheless, Jesus sees their faith, and he says to the paralyzed man, your, son, your sins are forgiven. You know, where in there is the man asking to be forgiven? I mean, when we think of, you know, re- repentance, we think of asking for forgiveness. And, you know, well and good, that that is definitely uh, there in repentance. But where is the request? Um, now, to be fair... Maybe it was there, and we just it's not documented, we don't see it, but um I think that it bears it bears some thought that there's there's not a a explicit um ask from the paralyzed man when Jesus saw the faith, he told the man. Son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 6, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, I think this bears a little thought as well, because the teachers of the law were thinking to themselves, and it gives us some indication of what that is. A um, couple interesting things to think about here. You know, this is Mark writing it, um, and Mark um, got his account from from an eyewitness. And there are some scholars who kind of attribute who you know Mark and Luke got their their account from. Um, Matthew obviously was there. John was there. But so someone would have had to have um, insight into knowing what those teachers of the law were sitting there. And now, of course, Jesus does ask the question, why are you thinking these things? But the the author would have to have had insight from someone to indicate what they were thinking. Does, does that follow? Um, also, I think it's it shows us too that um, sometimes by you know by God's uh, divine or sovereign desire, 
we can have access to know things that we wouldn't normally know. Now, that's not to say that every thought we have is, you know, is accurate, is special revelation like that, but um, we do see it here in action, and um, and they demonstrate that. And and Jesus uses it not to just point, not to point out. Uh, their sin, but to give them an, or make way for an opportunity for them to have a revelation of truth. Um, verse 7, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, their question here does kind of reinforce the reality that Jesus is God. Um, who can forgive sins but God alone? I mean, Jesus, you know, says in later in other places, "I and the Father are one." So, their their question, their issue, is is um, as a result an an indication of who Jesus is. Now, they don't have a revelation of that, but um, it's it's a good question in the sense of understanding, better understanding who Jesus is. Verse 8, immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I think that's an important thing to remember is when these types of miraculous things happen, they need and they must glorify God. When man is glorified or lifted up, you are on course to uh, destructive events. Um, It exalts pride and self and it strokes the ego and that is a very, very dangerous thing. And so the these the miraculous events that we most of us all long to see and be a part of and even to to operate in um, we must never lose connection with the necessity that things that happen at at the end of it all is to glorify God verse 13 once again Jesus went out beside the lake a large crowd came to him and he began to teach them As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. How many of you would, at at the beckoning of of someone, you maybe maybe Levi, which we we know as Matthew, maybe he had an indication of who Jesus was. Maybe he had seen what he had done or heard about him. Maybe he knew him. Maybe he didn't. Um, maybe there was just something about him that he knew he needed to follow, something that he was afraid to miss out on. Can you picture yourself being approached by someone who you felt was significant? You Maybe even you had an inclination that uh, they are doing God's will. If they walked up to you, in the let's say in the middle of your job where, where Levi was at the tax collector's booth, and they told you, follow me, what would you do? Um, I don't, uh, I, it's hard to even imagine or picture, but um, Levi leaves what he has and is doing, and he followed Jesus. Um, that's mind blowing and admirable. Verse 15 While Jesus was having dinner, At Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Hmm. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I'm going to try not to shed too much of my opinion on this verse here. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, some would say that Jesus is saying, I've not come to call those who think they are righteous, but but sinners. And while that could be a fair conclusion to draw, it's not what it says. I've not come to call those who think they're righteous. It says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Is there something there in the text um, now it's not saying don't hear that Jesus is saying eh, if you're already righteous then you you know I'm not calling you obviously there is none righteous not one and everyone must follow Jesus he is the way the truth and the life there is no way to the father but through him but I think it it warrants a little thought is as to think on what is what is Jesus saying here. Um, I don't think it's saying I've not come to call those who think they are righteous. I don't think it. I don't think it's saying that. Um, so maybe chew on that additionally as you study it out yourself. Verse eighteen. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth On an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. I think here Jesus is trying to get them to think or to realize that he's doing something new. It's it's different than what they've known, and it doesn't fit the paradigm of what they have. And Jesus doesn't say, "Well, you'll you'll never fast again." He says, "How can they? How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him." I think that is some indication of the role of fasting. I have actually written a a little booklet on the biblical context for fasting. Uh, You can check that out in the description. Uh, It's available through Amazon. Um, But I think there is many facets to the role of fasting as it's demonstrated in the Old and New Testament. But I think this is one of the elements, and it has to do with God's presence. And I think Jesus kind of illustrates that here. Verse 23, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath." This is, I think, another paradigm shift that Jesus is calling them to. They they have a high respect for the Sabbath, as they should, but they are, are getting it twisted 
And I think Jesus is trying to clarify that. They are serving the Sabbath, when in fact, Jesus is saying, you've got it backwards. The Sabbath is to serve man. And we find in later scriptures in the New Testament, especially in Paul's writing, he tries to clarify there's much contention and strife over the issue of Sabbath. Some think it's this day, some this, some that. And Paul tries to clarify this and say, don't let anyone uh, accuse you or talk you uh, uh, down or degrade you over uh, issues of the Sabbath. And I think that's one important point that we all should consider. There's many other points that could be discovered, but one of the fact is some practice the Sabbath on this day, some practice the Sabbath on that day. Um, it's it's a mindset. It's it's a paradigm. It's not this explicit cut and dry thing. It is. Um, it is essentially what Jesus demonstrates here by what he says. It's the Sabbath is to serve mankind, not for mankind to serve the Sabbath. And oh, just as a reminder, Jesus is Lord over even the Sabbath. So there's many things that I think Jesus is is trying to readjust their paradigm for and even in our day, he attempts to continuously readjust our paradigms. How many of us have these notions and ideas and and conclusions that we've drawn that we've held to for years or been taught for years that Jesus wants to bring some truth and uh, fresh identity to? Uh, I'm constantly being, um, I guess, challenged or... Um, you know, pressed, I feel like, in in things that I have maybe grown up thinking, thought, assumed, what have you. And I believe the Lord has just kind of vigorously over the years taken me on a journey of, of trying to re-explore these issues and understand the biblical truths or find the new truths biblically rooted in those paradigms or beyond them. So we'll wrap it up. That ends with uh, chapter 2. And I thank you so much for taking the time. Please um, share this with friends, uh, social media, um, so we can get this out to as many people. Thank you all for listening. Uh, those who have been with me through you know these nearly 250 episodes across I think something 80 countries. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in it, and I hope that he continues to grow it, that people come into a saving knowledge of who Jesus is and have a fresh um, desire for intimacy, nearness to God, and hunger to study his word and who he is. So thank you for being with me, and until next time, God bless. God bless.